In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I propose to you that that's perhaps the greatest verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, we began our series with the doctrine of Scripture because the Bible, God's Word, is the source and foundation for all that we believe and how we behave. If you are a Christian... Everything you believe and every way you behave should be based on the authority of God's Word. So we discovered the Bible is the inspired Word of God, that it is inerrant, that it is infallible, that it's trustworthy, that it's clear, that it's sufficient, and that we can build our lives on the solid rock of Scripture. It's so very important. But the natural progression now as we move from the doctrine of Scripture is what the Scriptures, the Word of God, says about God Himself. Someone called the Bible God's autobiography. And certainly we learn about God as He's revealed Himself to us in the Word of God. So we move to the Bible doctrine of God the Father. Now, as I said, we're going to look at God the Son, we'll look at God the Spirit, and we'll look at God triune, three in one. But this morning I want to speak about the general idea of God as our Father. Now there's no greater and more important knowledge for the believer than the knowledge of God Himself. Everything we are and everything we do based on our understanding of God as He's revealed in His Word. Let me give you some reasons why the knowledge of God is so important. Number one, it's the only way for a person to enter into life eternal. John 17 Verse 3. And by the way, I'm going to give you a lot of verses today. I won't read them all or we won't turn to them all. But you really want to get a pen and pencil out and write them down so you can look them up. John 17 and verse 3. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. And he actually says, Father, that he that 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 that, that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So Jesus Christ. Is praying to God the Father. So he's praying to God the Father from as God the Son. And he's actually saying to the Father that life eternal comes from knowing you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Second reason the knowledge of God is important is knowing God enables us to know ourselves. Remember Isaiah chapter 6? We looked at it a few weeks ago when we talked about the holiness of God. Isaiah saw an actual vision of God sitting on the throne. Can you imagine that? His train or glory filled the temple. And all the angels cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Well, Isaiah was actually filled with woe. And he said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the Lord, the Lord of glory. So in seeing God, we see ourselves. So when we come to know who God is, then and only then can we understand ourselves. As far as understanding man, his nature, and what man is, and why he does what he does, and him being redeemed, all of that starts with the knowledge of God. Everything in the Bible is theocentric. It's God at the center. And so if we're going to study anthropology, we need to start with theology, knowing God and that God was the one who created man in his image and likeness. And then thirdly, knowing God is important because it's the only way to understand the world or the cosmos. Not only do we understand man, but we understand cosmology. We understand the creation, that it was made by God, was made for God, it's sustained by God, and that it all points to God. Many times people will argue for the existence of God with what's called the cosmological argument that there's a cosmos, there must be a creator, that God created all things. And we're going to see that in Genesis 1, verse 1. And then we also know, fourthly and lastly, that the only, it's only through a knowledge of God that the people of God can be strong and do great things for God. Daniel 11, verse 32, where it says, the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploit. So a knowledge of God gives us strength and ability to live for God 
in a God-rejecting culture and world. Now, knowing facts about God and knowing God personally are two different things. Knowing information or studying as we're going to do today the attributes of God, that which can be attributed to God, and having a personal relationship with God are two different things. So it's not enough just to fill our heads with theology and knowledge of God or the doctrine of God. We must have a relationship with this living God. And when we understand who God is, we understand that we can have a relationship with God. Now, there's only two main points I want to make today. And the first one is, if you're taking notes, God can only be known by revelation. God can only be known, that's up on the screen, by revelation. Now, revelation is a very broad and vast subject. But the reason God can only be known by revelation or by revealing Himself is because God is transcendent. He's above, beyond all that we are, know, see, feel, and understand. And then secondly, God is infinite. God is infinite. And we are finite. So God is beyond us. God is limitless. And we are limited by time, space, and by our own intellect. So has God revealed Himself? Yes. And there are two basic ways that God has revealed Himself. He's revealed Himself in what's called general revelation. And that we're going to look at is in creation. But He's also revealed Himself in special revelation in the Word of God and in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, He first of all reveals Himself in general revelation or through creation. Here we have it in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, when time started, when matter was created, it was God, Elohim, who created heaven and earth. And then in verse 3, God spoke and said, let there be light. And there was light. When God created, He created out of nothing. God had no existing material. God didn't have time, space, matter. He had nothing. He alone existed. He is eternal. And He speaks with what's called fiat, or divine ability to speak things into existence. I know this kind of stretches our mind. I try to keep it as simple as we can. But the idea is that God is in His creation revealing Himself. So write down Genesis 1.1. There is a God. Now there are seven things refuted in this one verse, and I want to give them to you. Number one, in Genesis 1.1, it refutes atheism because the universe was created by God. God does exist. Secondly, it refutes pantheism, for God is transcendent to that which He created. So God is not the trees, God is not the flowers, God is not the sea, God is not the sun, God is not in nature, God is transcendent to nature. He created it. And then thirdly, it refutes polytheism for one God created all things. Now, not to get sidetracked again, but did you know that Mormonism is polytheistic? They believe in multiple gods. Your average Mormon doesn't always know that or wouldn't believe that, but they believe there are gods many and lords many. They actually teach what's called the Adam-God doctrine. The God that they believe they're accountable to today was Adam, and that Adam became God. And that's why they have their marriages sealed in the temple. That's why they would have prefer to have multiple wives, because then they have many wives to create their own world and their own planet. And on and on the insanity goes, which many people don't, don't understand. Mormonism is not Christianity. They want people to think that. It is polytheistic. There's only one God. Then also this, this verse, Genesis 1.1, it refutes materialism, for matter had a beginning. And even scientists today say that it all started with a big what? Bang. What banged the bang? That's what I want to know. Who lit the fuse? What banged? Where did what banged come from? Well, they say, well, you just believe that, that God always existed. Yeah, that's right. Either you believe God always existed, or some form of matter existed. One or the other. Those are your two options. Either God created the heavens and the earth, or it just happened 
by accident. It just exploded. What exploded? How did it explode? Where the explosion came from? We don't know. So basically, we, we accept both by faith, but the faith based on knowledge of what the model best supports, that God created the heavens and the earth. It also, fifthly, refutes dualism because God was alone when he created. There was no other gods. There was no other power. It wasn't good and evil. Not even the devil, which was Lucifer, was created yet at this time in Genesis 1.1. This verse also refutes humanism because God, not man, is the ultimate reality. One verse, first verse in the entire Bible, refutes humanism. God is the center of all reality and the source of all reality. And God exists. And seventhly and lastly, this one verse refutes evolutionism because God created all Things. And I believe that he created them by the word of his power. He didn't need any help. He didn't need any assistance. When he rested on the seventh day, it wasn't because he went, man, that's hard work. Speaking the universe into existence, I'm exhausted. No, there's no limit to his power. We're going to see that. So this one verse refutes atheism, pantheism, polytheism, materialism, dualism, humanism, and evolutionism. And on the list could go one verse, Genesis 1.1. But not only has God revealed himself in creation, in general revelation, which is also referred to in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Day unto day they utter their speech. Their line has gone out to the ends of the world. Anyone can look up into the sky and see the stars and know that there's a creator. But it also is given by Special revelation, God reveals himself. Now, special revelation has several ways God reveals, but I want to focus on two. The first is Jesus Christ, and the second is the Bible. You might actually argue for the existence of God by three things. Number one, the cosmos. Number two, man's conscience. And number three, Christ, who is God manifested in the flesh. But God specially, specifically, revealed himself in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, who is God in flesh, and also in the Bible, which is the written word. So Jesus is the living word, God is speaking, and the Bible is God's written word. Now, in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, no one has ever seen God at any time. The reason is because God is invisible, and God is spirit. But the only begotten Son of God, in the Greek it actually reads, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared Him in my King James Bible. That word declared means to exegete or to explain or to pull out. So Jesus Christ exegetes or explains God the Father. Remember when Jesus, in the upper room, John 14, said He was going to the Father's house, referring to heaven. And Philip actually said, Lord, if you just show us the Father, we'd be satisfied. What did Jesus say? Philip, have I been with you for so long you've never seen me? He who has seen me has what? Seen the Father. Now, Jesus is not the Father, but he reveals the Father. He is an explanation of who God is, Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, God has spoken in his son. God spoke through prophets. God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. Has in these last days spoken by, in, and through his son, by whom he made the worlds. But how do we know about Jesus other than the Bible, right? This is why it all comes back to the book. It seems no matter where we go, we have to come back to the Bible. Without the Bible, we have no clear understanding of who God is, who we are, about the cosmos. God's Word is inerrant and infallible, and we can rest our lives upon it. So God's Word is God's autobiographic uh, re revelation of Himself. And actually in Psalm 19, when you get down to verse 7 to 11, it's actually referring to the law of the Lord as a revelation of God. So you have the creation, 
speaking of God's glory. Then you have the Word of God revealing the person of God. Now, I'm going to give you, so hang on, this is my second main point. What does the Bible reveal about God? This is not exhaustive. Now, I shouldn't, I shouldn't apologize, but I'm going to give you 11 attributes of God. I'm not going to break them down in categories. I'm just going to give them to you. The list could go on and on and on. We could probably preach, preach for the next two or three weeks just on the attributes of God. But I've selectively picked out these 11 that I think are primary. Now, theologians like to call them not just attributes. We use that word because it can be attributed to God. But they call them the perfections of God because all of God's attributes are perfect because God is perfect. They're all transcendent. We all, they're all unknowable to man's mind unless God condescends to reveal them and He's revealed them in the Bible. How can we know if there's a God? The Bible. How can we know what God is like? The Bible. How can we know who Jesus is? The Bible. How can we know if there's a heaven or hell? The Bible. There's so many things that we learn through the Scriptures. But write them down. First of all, number one, the Bible reveals that He's a personal God. Where do you start when you talk about the nature and the attributes of God? Well, the Bible reveals to us that God, the God who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth of Genesis 1-1, the God of the Bible, is the true and living God. God's not a force, nor does it teach pantheism that God is in the creation, but God is transcendent and separate, but He's a personal being. Now we also need to remember in light of this that he is only there is only one God. There are not many gods. There's only one true and living God. Christianity is monotheistic. There's one God. But that one God is manifested in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, one God, three persons. And we'll break that down in a couple of weeks when we look at the Trinity. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was, listen to this very carefully, with God. So you have the Word that is eternal, referring to the second person of the Godhead Christ, with God, who's God the Father. So they're face to face, literally in the Greek. And the Word, who is eternal and is personal, face to face, with God the Father, is God, or God was the Word. So very, very important. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, there is only one God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 and 6, there is none other but one God. So we'll get into the Trinity, but it's not, tri it's, there's not three gods. There's only one God and three Persons. Now, how do we know that God is a person? Let me give you some evidence. Number one, God grieves, Genesis 6.6. 6. Number two, God hates, Proverbs 6.16. 6, Number three, God speaks, Genesis 1, verse 3. Number four, God hears, Psalm 94, verse 9. And number five, God loves, 1 John 4, verse 8, for God is love. Now, just a quick footnote. I didn't share this first service. When I say that God speaks and God hears, that doesn't mean that God has a mouth or that God has ears. When the Bible says God sees, God doesn't have eyes because God is spirit, John 4, verse 24, and they who worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Bible says also in Colossians 1.15 that God is invisible. This is why the incarnation, God becoming a man in Christ, is so marvelous. Because no one has ever seen God, but God became seen in the incarnation, Jesus Christ. That which was with the Father and was manifest to us. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So God is invisible. Now God doesn't have a mouth, God doesn't have hands, God doesn't have feet. The Bible uses those terms because it's easier for us to understand God. They're called anthropomorphisms. They're human terms described of God so that we can know God sees, God hears, 
God speaks, God feels, and God loves us, but God is not a man that he should lie. We also know that God wills. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is wise, Proverbs 3, verse 19, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens. In Romans 16, verse 27, he's called the only wise God. And last but not least, man is made in the image and likeness of God. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. So man can reason, man can think, man can communicate, man can feel. So much of what is humankind is actually the glory of God. Now, we are not divine. We will never be gods. And we look at mankind in a fallen state with a sinful nature. But man still bears the image of his Creator. Because human beings are unique. They are made in the image and likeness of God. How marvelous that is. Here's the second thing we learn in the Bible about God. Not only is He personal, and we can have a personal relationship with Him, but He is an eternal God. Now because He's eternal, it means He's self-existent. No one created Him and He didn't need anyone. And it also implies His immutability. He doesn't change. But again, He's eternal. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word. In Psalm 90 and verse 2, before the, before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you have formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In 2 Peter 3, verse 8, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is his one day. So God is eternal. Now, that means that God will never poof and cease to exist. We've been hearing a lot lately about the Time Magazine back in the late 60s that had the cover article, God is dead. If God was ever God, God could not die. God doesn't get old like us. God doesn't get decrepit like us. doesn't get this Cena like us. God never gets weaker like we are. Oh God, God's been around a long time. He's getting pretty weak. So God will never change. He's immutable. He's in eternal. God is the eternal, unchanging God. That means our salvation is eternal. That's why John Newton wrote in Amazing Grace, he said, when we've been there, that's heaven, for 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. I love it. He says, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So when we go to heaven, we're going to be in immortal, eternal bodies with an immortal, eternal God and an immutable God forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We're not going to find out after six billion years in heaven that God just died. Oh no, what are we going to do? He is eternal. He is from everlasting to everlasting. Time began in God. Time will come to an end in God. When we get to heaven, time will be no more. How amazing that is. So here's number three. The Bible reveals that He is a sovereign God. He's a personal God. Number two, He's an eternal God. Number three, He's a sovereign God. Now a lot of people don't like this. They rebel against that. They shake their little fist at God and tell God what He can do and can't do. But God sits on the throne and God takes orders from no one. you understand that? He is a sovereign God. The word sovereign means chief, highest, or supreme. When Jehoshaphat prayed his great prayer in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6, he said, O Lord, a God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest thou not over all the kingdoms of the, of the heathen? Psalm 135, verse 6 Whatsoever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and in earth. Now, I don't have any problems with that. God can do whatever He wants at any time, and I'm not going to shake my little fist at God and say, God, that's not fair. God does what He wants. God is sovereign. 
He is often called the Almighty God. Here's number four. The Bible reveals that God is omniscient. Now I want you to turn now to Psalm 139. We're going to see the background for these attributes of God from this psalm. Psalm 139. And the first thing we see is God's omniscience. God is omniscient. And we see that in the psalm in verses 1 to 6. Follow with me as I read Psalm 139, verse 1 to 6. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and know me. So this is a psalm describing God's, first of all, omniscience. You know my down sittings and my uprisings. You understand my thoughts afar off. In the Hebrew, that's you understand my thoughts in their origin. You know what I think before I think it. You can pass my path, verse 3, my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. You have beset me behind and before, verse 5, you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Lord, the fact that you know me this intimately and thoroughly is more than I can understand. Now, I want you to notice these five things. God knows what I do. Verse 2, it says, you know my down sittings and my up risings. Now that word down sittings means my bad times. The word up rising is conveying the good times. So you know when I'm down, you know when I'm up, you understand my thoughts afar off. So he knows what I do. Then number two, God knows what I think. This is pretty scary sometimes. God knows what you're thinking right this minute, by the way. He knows your thoughts. You understand my thoughts, verse 2, afar off. You understand them in their origin. You ever think about what you think about and wonder why you think about what you think about? Let's think about that. Where did that come from? Why did I think that? That's a bizarre thought. God knows what we think before we even think it. God knows why we think it. All things are naked and open before the eyes of him whom we have to do. God knows your thoughts. This is an awesome thing. God knows my thoughts. Thirdly, God knows where I go. Verse 3, you can pass my path, which is daytime. My lying down, which is nighttime. If you're old, it happens during the day too. You lie down. You are acquainted with all my ways. God knows what I say. Verse 4, not a word in my tongue, but lo, Lord, you know it all together. God knows every word that you utter and why you say what you say. And God knows what I need. I love it. Verse 5. Thou hast beset me behind, which is my past, and before, which is my future, and laid thy hand upon me, which is a present. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. So God is transcendent. So the background for all these verses is that God knows everything. Omniscient means God knows everything. Now, I've met people who think they're omniscient. Don't look at your neighbor right now. You know, the person that really knows a lot knows that he doesn't know much. People who think they know everything know very little. But you know that God never learns anything new? He never discovers. He's never taught. He's never instructed. He's never given more information. God, like I, 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 I got, I got to fill you in here, God. Let me, let me. Sometimes when we pray, it's a, let me tell you, let me, let me tell you the scoop, Lord. Now He wants to hear from us, but God isn't writing it down. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. You need the money by this Friday. Oh, okay, God. Whew. What time on Friday? We got to get it there quick. Did you know what they said, Lord? Yes, yes, he knows what they did. You know what they did, Lord? Yes. Do you know what our bank account is right now, God? Yes. Do you know what the doctor just said, Lord? Yes, he knows. You know that I find comfort in knowing he knows. God knows our every weakness. He knows our every need. 
God knows that we are but dust. He knows our frame. And I rest in that. When I understand who God is, that God knows everything, I rest in that. It brings security. It also brings sensitivity. When God warns me about a sin, I know that God is smarter than I am. You know, as a father and a grandfather, so often I wish my kids would just sit down and say, Father, Thou art wise. Wilt Thou tell us what to do? They get a little, a little, a little obesity. My dad used to say, I wasn't born yesterday. Now I'm saying it. I'm not stupid. I wasn't born yesterday. Well, God wasn't born yesterday. And God's not stupid. He knows. So you can rest in His wisdom. And when God warns you about sin, take sexual immorality. Can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? You ought to listen to that. Because he's smarter than you are. When God gives His instruction, the moral laws of God, we're not going to look at all the moral attributes of God in this list. But we should listen. We should, take, we should take counsel from the wise, omniscient God. I also find comfort in my circumstances. But it's also sobering because one day we will stand before this all-knowing God and we will give an account of our lives to Him. How important that is. He determines the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Psalm 147, verse 7. In the Living Bible, that translates, He counts the stars and calls them all by name. Think about that. God's infinite knowledge. Here's number five attribute. He's an, omnipot he's an om 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 omnipresent God. Which means God is everywhere present all the time completely. Not part of God. Everywhere. There is no such thing as a God-forsaken place. God is everywhere present all the time. God's presence is omni. He's everywhere. Psalm 139, verse 7 to 12. Let's read it. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? Now notice, those are two questions. The psalmist knows the answer. This is a rhetorical Two rhetorical questions. He knows he cannot escape the presence of God. Why? Because God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present. If I ascend, verse 8, to the heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, which by the way in the Hebrew is Sheol, which could be the grave or in death, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand, this is a, human language to describe God who doesn't have a hand. Thy hand will lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. And if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, darkness hides not from thee, but the night shines as the day. I love that. And the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. God doesn't say, turn the lights on, I can't see. You know, we're always lighting a flashlight or turning the lights on or trying to get better light so we can see. God doesn't need the light. Light and darkness make no difference. So whether it's speed, verse 8, the wings of the morning, verse 9, which are speed, space, verse 8, wherever I go, or darkness or light, verse 11 and 12, it doesn't matter to God. God is everywhere. You know, some of the times when I've had to travel a great distance in an airplane, and you're way up flying at 30,000 feet, going over the North Pole or the South Pole or crossing the Atlantic Ocean, I'll sometimes look out that window and see the vastness of God's creation and think, God, you're with me right here. Not a blessing to know that wherever you go, God is. If I take the wings of the morning, that's a Hebrew figure speech for traveling at the speed of light. And I go to the uttermost ends of the earth, there's God. If I go the other direction and go to hell, there's God. I can't escape God. Jonah tried to escape God. And he got swallowed by a whale. I heard of a little boy that was asked about Jonah and the story of the whale. And he said, the Sunday school teacher said, what does it teach you? And the little boy said, 
It teaches us that people make whales sick. <laughs> but that's awesome. They spit them out. Bombing them. You can't run from God. You can't get on a ship to Tarshish and get away from the presence of God. You can't hide from God because God is everywhere present and we cannot escape Him. In Psalm 23, David said, Even when I walk through the deep dark valley, shadow of death, Thou art what? You're with me. He will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, Christ. You hear number six. The Bible tells us that God is omnipotent. Now that simply means all powerful. Omniscient, He knows everything. Omnipresent, He is everywhere. Omnipotent, He has all power. There is no limit to God's power. Certainly, that comes into play in Genesis chapter one. God created Bara the heavens and the earth, out of nothing by His divine power. He just spoke it. That's a marvelous truth. But see it here in Psalm 139, verse 13 to 18. I love this. The psalmist says, verse 13 of Psalm 139, For thou hast possessed my reign. Now that word possessed means formed my inward parts. It's talking about God's power to create a human being. Thou hast covered me, or protected me, in my mother's womb. We wonder if abortion is the murder of a human being. Read these verses. Is that a person in the womb? Yes. You've protected me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, verse 14, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So we're created. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knows right well. My substance, which is my bones and my unformed body, was not hid from me when I was made in secret. Those are Hebrewisms or figures of speech for the child developing in the womb. Curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. We get our word embroidered from that phrase, curiously wrought. God knit me, embroidered me in my mother's womb. Your eyes, and again, God doesn't have eyes, but we know He sees, did see my substance, my unformed body, as yet being imperfect or unformed, but not unhuman. Unformed, yes, but not unhuman. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. I love the NIV's rendering of this. All the days ordained for me, were written in your book before one of them came to be. All my days were written by God before one came to be. How precious, verse 17, is thy thoughts unto me. And I, I believe that this is God thinking of us, not we thinking of Him. O oh God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, verse 18, they are more in number than the sand. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm still with you. So we go to sleep at night and God stays awake and watches over us. God thinks about us. So this is describing the omnipotent power of God to create in the womb. A marvelous miracle of God. God is all-powerful. You know what it means also for the believer? John 10, verse 27 to 30. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give to them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, there it is, which gave them me, is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. One in essence. We're both divine. So God has the power to create us, to sustain us, and to keep us. Here's number seven. We've got to move along. The Bible describes God as holy. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. The background in Psalm 139, verse 19 to 42. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, verse 20, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? 
and I'm not I greed with those that rise up against thee. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them as mine enemy. This is what's known as righteous indignation. Search me. Here's the prayer. O oh God. Verse 23. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, anything of unholiness. And then lead me in the way everlasting, which is the way of holiness. So God is holy. The Bible says, be ye holy, even as God is holy. It means that he's separate from sinners. Nothing sinful or evil in God, perfectly righteous, pure, and just. Here's number eight. God is merciful. Write down Exodus 34, verse 7, 6 and 7. The Lord thy God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, there it is, and transgression and sin. God does not give us what we deserve. You ever think about the mercy of God? You know that there's no reason why God should show us mercy. The reason lies in God Himself, who is a merciful God. You know what it means also? My God is compassionate. I would rather be judged by God than you. Because God is a lot more merciful than you are. People are so cruel. God is so kind. He's compassionate. He's full of tender mercies. And every morning when I wake up, if I exhausted His mercy the day before, they're new every morning. Amen? God does not give us what we deserve. The God of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who is our Father in heaven, is a God who is merciful. He forgives our sins. And then, ninthly, write it down. The God, Bible reveals that God is loving. 1 John 4, verse 8, God is love. Oh, the love of God. And then number 10, He is a gracious God. Psalm 116, verse 5, Gracious is the Lord. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, By grace you have been what? Saved. So God is merciful. He doesn't give us what we deserve. God is gracious. He does give us what we do not deserve, which is eternal life, salvation. But here's my last point. And again, the frustration is that this list could go on. We can look at the names of God and other attributes of God. But I wanted to end with this number 11. God is our Father in heaven. He is our Father God. I know people say, well, I didn't have a, didn't have a good father on earth. He's nothing like that. Didn't you just hear the attributes we just covered? He's kind. He's merciful. He's gracious, He's loving, He's compassionate. If you are a Christian, now only Christians can say God is their Father. God is the Creator of all mankind, but He's only the Father of those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and been born again of His Spirit into the family of God. You become His child and God becomes your Father. So the Bible does not teach the universal fatherhood of God. You can't say God is your Father unless you've been born again through faith in Jesus Christ. But when Jesus came, He said, when you pray, say what? Our Father. You know what, you know what, what word He used? He used the word Abba. Our Abba. Our Daddy. Our Papa. It was a word used in the Hebrews uh, when, the, when the infants first uttered Dada, or Papa. He said, Daddy, Abba. So Jesus, and only Christianity, this, this is so profound, only in Christianity is God declared to be our Father. Not found even in Judaism. Not found in, in Judaism, He's the Father of a nation, but not of us as individuals. And to the Jew, even this would be blasphemy to call God our Abba. And yet Jesus did that. Every time Jesus prayed, except for on the cross, when He said, My God, My God, why have You forsaken Me? He used the word Abba. And he instructed us to do the same. First line in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and of earth. Now the implications are staggering. God created us, God sustains us, and God is our Father. Read Matthew chapter 6 when you get a chance. Where Jesus talking about God's your Father means you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and what you're going to put on. Some of you got up to get dressed for church. You stood in the closet or looked in your closet and you about had a nervous breakdown. What do I wear? What do I wear? Oh God, have mercy on me. Please help me. Call your friend. What do I wear today? What do you think? Those are the things the heathens worry about. And Jesus said, your father knows you have need of these things. And he actually said this. He goes, he goes, check out the birds. Christians should be bird watchers. Not one sparrow falls to the ground, but what your father takes notice. You are of more value than many sparrows. He said to the disciples, look at the flowers in the field. He said they don't toil, they don't spin. And Solomon in all his glory was not raised like one of these flowers which today are and tomorrow are cast into the what? The oven. You know, right now we're all stoked to see the California pansies along the freeway. You better go look at them this afternoon because they're going to be gone tomorrow. They won't last. Not around here they won't. But God loves you. He provides for you. He takes care of you. He clothes you. He feeds you. Therefore, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things shall be added. You don't have to worry. You have a Father who is all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing, eternal, merciful, kind, loving, gracious. He's your Father in heaven. Amen? Let's pray.